Right, let's begin. Um, sorry, it's me again. I won't talk too much. Uh, here we get into the tough matters of international politics and how they are squeezing and changing uh, our world and how it may impact the behavior of humanitarian organizations and human rights activists. So um, we're going to go in the following order. Um, Guadalupe uh, will go first, then Joel will go second, and then Antonio will be third. Um, Guadalupe will um, speak to us about the challenges faced by um, human rights defenders and activists. She's head of the Global Human Rights Defenders Program and Amnesty, and she will um, tell us what that program um, is doing. Joel is uh, the chief of MDM, our co-host for this event, and he will speak more perhaps from the operational uh, NGO perspective on how this shifting political landscape uh, is uh, changing things. And finally, Antonio, um, who wrote a, 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 a rousing, um, uh, doom-laden uh, commentary for my publication, Irin, about the death of hum multilateralism, will take up uh, the final slot and will look um, towards the future. And uh, he has worked on many of these issues for, for some time and will introduce whichever of his personas he chooses to use today at the right time. So, Guadalupe, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it was very interesting listening to, listening to the first sort of the keynote speakers a few uh, minutes ago, or maybe it's now hours already. And maybe if I start by saying that, yes, I think we all agree in this room that uh, there is a backlash against the uh, human rights. But maybe if I also provoke you in saying that that doesn't, in my mind, mean that the world is a worse place than when I was a child you know, in the 60s and the 70s. I think the world is a better place for many than when I was a child. If I just think at my childhood in Mexico City, and I am sure in this country as well and in many others from where all you come from, very few people in the 60s could buy the Encyclopedia Britannica and have then that information and therefore have that knowledge and therefore have the power. It was a very small minority. My family couldn't afford it and we were ordinary middle class, an ordinary middle class Latin American family. Whereas now, when I go to remote villages in Latin America, in many of those remote villages, with 50 cents of the dollar, quite a few people can get into the internet, spend an hour on the internet, download quite a few things or just read them there and have far more information than what we had 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and maybe even 25 years ago only before, because I started having internet in 2005. So I don't think it is a worse world. Yes, there is a backlash against human rights, but I think we're living in a better world. More people have information, more people have knowledge, and therefore I suggest more people have power. More to do, yes. If I think about when I started working um, in Latin America in the human rights world, I started in Peru in the 1990s. At the time, mid-90s, Alberto Fujimori, the president who is now in jail for human rights abuses, one of the charges he, had, he faced, he decided to pull out of the inter-American system of human rights. And it was a scandal. The region screamed, Amnesty International screamed, local human rights organizations screamed, and they had to come back into the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. If anybody then had told me that actually Britain, the country where I live now, was going to think of pulling out of the European system of human rights, in the mid, you know, at the, in the next century, in 2014, 2015. I'm not talking Brexit, I'm talking the European Court of Human Rights. I would, have, I would have answered at the time, don't be ridiculous. And I think that's how maybe naive, not, and not because I thought that Britain or the West, whatever, were excellent countries and everybody was wonderful, but I did think, and I think many of us at the end of the 90s thought that we had won the battle 
or we were no, not won the battle. We were to, we were moving towards winning the battle. In 1998, the international community, the UN, adopted the declaration for the recognition and protection of human rights defenders. And that declaration was adopted by consensus. It was a big step forward. Here we are 20 years later. Are human rights defenders being recognized, applauded, protected? Maybe not. Our annual report of last year, just to give you some numbers, if I find them, I've lost them after organizing my whatever, my notes here. 22 countries, we reported that in 22 countries, people were killed for peacefully standing up for rights. In 63, they faced smear campaigns. In 68 countries, they were arbitrarily arrested. In 94, they were threatened, intimidated, attacked. That was only last year. So definitely, they're not being recognized or protected. Uh, since the declaration was adopted in 1998, human rights organizations, us and other international and locals, we estimate that at least 3,500 human rights defenders have been killed around the world. If you do the maths, that means one every two days in the last 20 years, one every two days. And I calculated that again as I was sitting here, you know, just in case I had done the math wrong in the calculator on the, on the phone, and it's about one every two days, uh, you know, killed in the last 20 years since that recognition. So they're not being recognized, quite on the contrary. They're being killed and they're being smeared. And most, and most of these killings, if you, look, um, if you look at the killings, they could have been prevented because they don't happen in isolation. It's usually people who have been campaigned, taken injustice personally, you know, wanting a fairer uh, world, who have been threatened for months for years, authorities know they have been threatened and nothing is done, you know, to protect them. Everybody, I think, or many of you heard of Berta Cáceres in Honduras just um, last year. You know, she even had protection, me me uh, protection measures, measures from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights from, you know, dating 10 years ago or so, and she was killed last year. And of course, they're being killed, human rights defenders are being killed by state actors and non-state actors, which makes, which makes it more complicated this, um, in, in, in this new world order or in this new age. So what are we at Amnesty doing about it? Don't look at me, Ben, please. Look at the audience. Sorry, he's already telling me I'm talking too much. Okay, <laughs> one more minute. So what are we as Amnesty doing uh, about it, you know, to make sure that human rights defenders are recognized and protected. And maybe just to say that I think many of you here are human rights defenders. Human rights defenders aren't sort of a, the, the, the heads of NGOs or professionals. It's anybody that takes injustice personally, peacefully, and accepts the universality on human rights. So I think you know, we should be all encouraged to say that we are um, human rights defenders. So Amnesty has launched a global campaign for the recognition and protection of human rights defenders. And in order to counteract the narrative, that sort of attack that we're getting, where human rights seem to be, on, human rights appear to be undesirable for those you know, in power, we have, what we're doing is making sure that we talk about people, because I think it was John this morning that said we have to sort of get the heart back into our jobs. You know, this isn't about this international law, this is about common humanity, tolerating and, you know, caring after ourselves wherever we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, Guadalupe just says the world is not uh, worse than before. Anyway, for the humanitarian field actors, uh, currently we face more and more crises. There is more and more humanitarian crises, more and more conflict. Even if the world globally is better, uh, for humanitarian field actors, it's more and more complicated to access to the population. Uh, 
I'm sure a big part of you are field humanitarian actors, but the UN system is not working anymore. Uh, the Security Council is not working. Even, uh, I, I used to say quite often that even rules, even war have rules. Okay, I'm, t I'm talking too loud. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I used to say that uh, even war have rules, and the rules of war are, are, have never been so non-respected. Huh? I'm talking about Yemen, I'm talking about Syria, I'm talking about Nigeria, uh, I see some Palestine colleagues, uh, Libya, I mean, it's, uh, it's worse and worse for us to access to the population. Humanitarian actors are targeted, health facilities are targeted, schools are targeted, uh, so, uh, my introduction will be short, but the, in link with the, with the topic, it's uh, for, for real NGO, for independent NGO, for impartial NGO, uh, we, f we face so, so many issues that we have to adapt our way of, of operation, we have to adapt w our way to access to the population, so we are really in a changing world. Uh, in terms of humanitarian access. Okay, I guess that gives me more time then. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to give you, uh, because John Ging said this morning that we should not over-intellectualize, I'm going to try to intellectualize a bit. So I'll give you two quotes, actually two and a half quotes. But my starting point is something that was mentioned this morning about how the, the state system that we have, the multilateral, multilateral system that we have is in deep crisis. And uh, you know, a lot, many of us suffered uh, about what was happening in Aleppo the same way as we ask ourselves about what is happening in Yemen and South Sudan today. And I'll read you a quote, uh, and then I'll tell you who it's by. Aleppo is to Syria today what Guernica was to Spain during the Civil War, a martyred city and the harbinger of more disasters to come. Equally, the United Nations risks becoming in the 21st century what the League of Nations became in the 20th, irrelevant. Now, this is not written by some uh, rabid uh, NGO person or uh, leftist intellectual. This is actually written by the French permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, Ambassador Delattre, and a French academic. And I think the fact that even one of the P5 members recognizes that the system is broken is um, a, a lesson in itself. And it, it goes beyond this crisis of multilateralism. It goes beyond Trump. It goes beyond Brexit. I think we have to look also at Europe and how Europe, the cradle of the Enlightenment, uh, is uh, putting up barriers, is externalizing its borders, it's uh, uh, promoting uh, lopsided deals with Turkey and Libya to uh, protect itself, so-called, from the flow of migrants or asylum seekers. The, the whole concept of asylum is uh, becoming basically meaningless. So uh, this sort of gives us a sense of uh, where we are, wars are becoming more violent. We see, as someone mentioned earlier, that we are in uh, uh, IHL free zones. Uh, and here comes the second, the half quote. Uh, Peter Mora uh, at a conference in, uh, in Geneva a couple of months back said that we live in a pre-Solferino world. Now, I tried to get the exact quote and for some reason, it seems to have been erased from the, the talk, because even that maybe was too much for our friends in the ICRC, challenging uh, the way in which wars are conducted. And the third quote um, is about the kind of world that we're living in. And uh, pardon my age, but I'm going to mention Antonio Gramsci, who's not too much studied these days. But he says, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. And I think what we are seeing is a lot of morbid symptoms. And to return to our changing landscape, I think 
the question that we need to ask ourselves, or one of the questions we need to ask is, what will the geopolitical shifts that we are seeing, uh, what will they mean for the future of humanitarian action? I think it's useful to remind ourselves that humanitarian action or the humanitarian enterprise as we now know it has grown in parallel over the past 200 years with the expansion of the capitalist system to the far corners of the world. And now the capitalist system seems to be uh, changing in the sense that the traditional centers of the system, Western Europe and the United States, are retreating. Certainly the, the US is uh, uh, retreating, and we have a parallel increase or shift of the power of economics from the West to the East. So if the West is declining and the East is rising, what kind of impact will this have on our enterprise? I think we can uh, um, expect some kind of decolonization of the humanitarian system in the sense that it will no longer be controlled by the forces that controlled it up to now. This oligopoly of uh, um, a handful of donors, a handful of UN agencies, and a handful of federations of NGOs, including those present in this room. Uh, I think that is the old model. I think the business model is likely to change. It's likely to become more statist, more sovereignty-based, uh, for better or worse. And I think that the challenge for us is going to be how do we manage this shift from a system that we know and criticize all the time to a system that we don't know and that might be more challenging to work with. So my last point is about the dark side. And the dark side is an accentuation of this uh, trend that I'm uh, mentioning here. And it could be that over the next 20, 30, 40 years, uh, the resources that the West has been making available, and they are not huge, as uh, John Ging mentioned this morning, that for internal shifts in our Western societies, it may no longer be possible to extract from the tax base, from the taxes that you and I pay, uh, the resources to finance humanitarian assistance. Because uh, population is, is uh, aging, there may be more internal uh, needs for welfare, uh, there may be shifts in how we look at the world. And so I think that the, 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 the humanitarian action is going to leave, going to have to get used to leaving its comfort zone. The love affair between donors, uh, UN agencies and NGOs may change, may end, and uh, in the dark side all sorts of things can happen. Um, so the oligopoly may go and it will be replaced maybe by um, a, a multiplex kind of humanitarian world where you will have different sets of organizations responding to different sets of needs and not all of these organizations will identify in our beloved humanitarian principles. A final point is returning to something that was said this morning. How do we as humanitarians square uh, our unhappiness, our malaise about the state of the world with the fact that we uh, are supposed to be working in the here and now. And I think it's important in our minds to make a distinction between, between what we do as humanitarians, and that's addressing need. And I agree with the quote from Pictet this morning that you can't sacrifice uh, a life today for a life tomorrow. But as, um, as citizens, I think we have to show our indignation much more. Actually, I'm uh, indigné. How do you say it in English? Um, <laughs> indignant at the lack of uh, engagement of civil society around the world on the issues that we're dealing with here today. I'm old enough to remember uh, the protests against the Vietnam War in the 1960s, including in Berlin, which was a very, very active place where protests uh, were happening with Rudy Dutschke and his comrades. Uh, and, you know, because I'm speaking to an audience of young people, you know, show your indignation. I mean, how can we accept that uh, uh, the principles, the IHL uh, standards that we've set are so blissfully ignored, whether it's by states and, uh, or non-state actors? And how, how is it possible that uh, uh, the countries who are supposed to be the guarantors of these principles at the Red Cross Conference, you know, the law says that it's not only the people who are the forces that are involved in a, uh, in a conflict that have to respect the law. Uh, also, 
All the signatories to the law have a collective responsibility to ensure that the law is respected. So I think what we need is a civil society movement, which will not be totally humanitarian, uh, to put pressure on our member states, on our governments, and you know, involving civil society at all levels in the north and in the south. Maybe I'm dreaming, but I think that's the way to go. Thank you, all three of you. I've, I just wanted to exploit my position on a couple of follow-ups, and then we'll go out to the floor. I think, Joel, we didn't hear from you. Perhaps you were trying to stick to time. Mm -hmm. you know, how many of these things have you done, really? Um, take a little bit, a couple more minutes, and please give us an example of how you change, how you tackle this environment that you described. Which country is particularly tricky? Where are you trying new approaches? But, uh, hey, sorry. Um, everywhere, but if you don't mind, I want to jump on uh, Antonio. <laughs> um, now, because the humanitarian system is not only the UN system. Huh? Uh, a big part of the NGO and uh, Doctor Without Border and Doctor of the World are part of this NGO that are based on mobilization of the civil society in the north, but also in the south. Uh, and I, f I think we are a part of the future of, of the humanitarian action. The humanitarian action now in Europe, start in Europe. Uh, there is no, not a migrant crisis. There is a crisis of welcoming people. There is a crisis of our states that do not respect the law, that do not apply the law they sign in, for refugees. And so this is the humanitarian action also of, uh, of these days, of, of these current days. For the field approach, it's a bit the same. Uh, more and more our actions are based on partnership with civil society and less and less, and I hope, and for me it's not a problem, but less and less with the UN system. We are not, uh, I don't like this vision of the humanitarian action where NGOs are implementing partner of the UN system. And when I talk about real NGO, is that our economic model is based on the public generosity and not on the donors. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I think you can understand that I'm not one of the bigger fans of the UN system, so I will not cry for the collapse of the UN system, but uh, I think there is, there is hope, because the world has changed, there, there is hope in reinforcing the civil society in Eastern countries, in Western countries, in South, in South country, and people as a, as a future of the humanitarian. Uh, maybe not the UN, maybe not uh, some NGO. Uh, for me, an uh, uh, NGO is, is financially independent, is politically independent. On field, we see more and more confessional organizations, uh, organizations that are linked with uh, parties in power. So, so maybe I, I, I will answer to question after. Thank you. Guadalupe, maybe a, a follow-up to this first round. Um, do you agree that civil society is not as, as vigorous as it should be? Just maybe a, one reaction. I love the Gramsci quote, uh, quote. I am with you on that, and maybe, you know, I'm equally a bit old, but I, think, I do think that that's what's sort of uh, happening at the moment. I don't think we know where this is heading, so there's panic including among those sitting here. So we don't know how to react to this, but it is sort of a, it is a big transition and we don't know where it's going. But the old is finished, as usually the old, but it's the, the big old is finished. The 20th century is finished. And human rights are actually, uh, human rights as we, you know, as Amnesty was created in 61 and the way it's developed in the, it's very much a 20th century concept as we know it now. So I think, you know, something we will need to sort of rethink that. I am not so sure whether it's true that, you know, everybody was more indignant when you were young. Antonio, you know, I've, I've got a 20-year-old son, not that he's perfect, but, you know, they were indignant because a colleague in London in his school was going to be chucked out because he, he arrived from Bangladesh when he was five and the school sort of organized and they all t did a petition. Now maybe they didn't do the petition as you, but I, I suggest that there were more people together in that than when you were a child, which was a smaller group. So I'm not so sure whether I agree with that. Great, thank you. 
Right, let's, um, let's open it up to the floor. Our artist, of course, will make it all make sense, even if we don't make sense. So um, many thanks to Claudia. Um, we have two gentlemen there. We could start there. Good morning. Um, my name is Alex. I work with the uh, German Red Cross in, in Iraq. Uh, my question is uh, to you, Guadalupe. Um, you mentioned, you know, the sort of advance of, of progress and, and what you've already seen um, just alone in your lifetime. And I think even uh, younger people will agree that the advent of uh, technological progress is, is certainly an exponential curve. So it's something that we can experience as well. How do you feel, though, um, has this uh, increasing access to information, uh, specifically, you know, IT and so on, uh, how do you reconcile that with the phenomena that we see in terms of how social media and other uh, IT applications are actually being misused to, to misrepresent realities and to spread uh, not only falsehoods but also very much hatred um, and that this is um, you know, a driving factor in the populism and the nationalism that we see now which also threaten our humanitarian ideals? Yeah, actually, my question goes pretty much the same way as uh, Alex was just uh, saying. I I'm wondering how much the uh, the, the, this changing landscape is actually a changing perception of what is actually going on. I'm not quite sure whether the violations of human rights and so on, whether this has at all changed over time, but whether this is more a perception problem. And I also would think that a lot of the reactions in people today you just have to see them in a different way. People don't go on the street uh, anymore maybe waving uh, posters uh, because they have other media and they're using modern media to actually become active. So I think the whole perception uh, it has changed very much, but maybe the, the factual content has not over time. So I'm wondering what you think about this. I take the advice to be provocative today from Volker this morning. So we talk a lot about protests and civil society need to become more active. Are we not way too soft at the moment as the organizations? We're, we're pushing it and looking for excuses. The donors are not financing enough. The donors are not financing the right things. Do, do we not have to go back to the point to say, this is what humanitarian action is about, to be needs-based, looking into the population, not into what donors are financing, and if they don't finance the right thing, why are we not talking about it? We're not criticizing governments in the countries we're working in because who we could be sent out. We're not criticizing the governments that are financing us because we could lose money. We're not criticizing the donors because maybe they are not financing the next project or the next programming. So do we not have to refocus our core of our humanitarian action back to the needs of the population as a group of humanitarian organizations and not leaving criticism to a few who then are running more into a risk of being expulsed from countries than if anyone would talk about it? Okay. Just, maybe just very quickly to react to what you were saying, I'll leave it to the humanitarians here to see what the problems are with the humanitarian sector. But I think that, you know, there is, um, we've been talking to each other for the last 20 years, you know, we think, I mean, from an amnesty perspective, you know, we, we sit there and we think we've been very strong. We've been just sort of clapping at each other as to a great press release, a great campaign. But then we've lost track of have we really have the impact. We've been living in a bubble as well, I suggest, you know, all of us together. Uh, then on the issue of, you know, the per perils, perils is danger, yes, of uh, the internet and mass surveillance and the attacks, you know, yes, and we are, you know, grabbling, grabbling with that. And uh, what I suggest needs to happen, that aspect need, needs to be regulated. Just as before, the things that we haven't yet, you know, we, we made, we, in, we uh, screamed that nobody could enter my house without a warrant. 
Okay, so now at the moment, you know, we're trying to say, well, somebody has to regulate this because they're entering everything. So we need to get back to that without necessarily throwing the baby together and saying that, you know, all of this uh, new technology is actually wrong. I think it's quite good, but we just need to regulate and I don't think we're there yet. Sorry. No, uh, for... Maybe I don't understand what is the question, so please correct me if it's not the case. Uh, for the, to look for SQs, saying donors and blah, 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 they, we, we, we are living a time where there, there is a maximum amount of money on humanitarian. It's not true to say that there is no more donors. Uh, the problem is uh, that the changing of la landscape, the, the problem is the instrument to, in, oh, sorry for my English, uh, uh, is the instrumentalization of this, uh, of this package, of this money. And humanita humanitarian action is not only a question of fund. I, th I think we should, we should take care with this world. I don't want to come back on the speech about the UN, but there is different ki kind of actors, there is different way of doing humanitarian action. And as NGO, as this is also an NGO meeting here, uh, it's, it's not just a question of donor policy, it's not just a question of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think, I really believe in the civil societies. If you see Turkey and Syria right now, uh, there is lots of movement in Turkey that want to change, uh, to, to impact, I'll give you a concrete example, sorry, it will be maybe easier for my English. To be a member of an NGO, an amnesty, you know that too, in Turkey, it's already a commitment. To be a member of, uh, in, not international, but humanitarian NGO, trying to take care about the Syrian. In, uh, in Turkey, you have four millions of refugees, okay? Three of them are Syrians, uh, and so there is populations that do not need international NGO to do this kind of support. There is civil society who needs support of us for, for funding, for sure, but for methodology, for resources, for training. For, so maybe we can't act on the Turkey field, but there is, there is this is civil society, uh, sorry, uh, which need our support. Uh, no, just to clarify, um, I, I know that there's lots of diversity in the humanitarian system and that lots of interesting uh, things are happening in the margins and that new forms of organizations are, are appearing. But the reality is that the power in the system is still very much concentrated in this triad of uh, uh, UN agencies, a handful of donors, and the major NGOs. Whether we like it or not, that's where the global governance aspect of this enterprise takes place. The, the rules of the game are set by, you know, uh, the interagency standing committee, by the donor mechanisms, by uh, the, the, uh, the way in which we, um, by the log frames that we use, God forbid, by the clusters. So th there is a hidden power in the, this network of, uh, of organizations that is very difficult to shake off. And the question I ask myself is, if it's true that power is leaking from the old west to the new east and other parts of the world, what are the implications of this for the way in which uh, humanitarian action is being run? I can't imagine China not developing over the next 10, 15 years sophisticated ways of using its soft power. I can't imagine India not doing the same. Same as we've done in the West. So, uh, you know, I think we're, uh, you know, there's this Chinese so-called curse, may you live in interesting times, and our times are gonna be quite interesting. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Per Biemann, NRC, Germany. I'm thinking, when I, when I hear what you're saying, but it's difficult to um, get people 
onto the street. It's, so we need a civil society movement to put pressure in. Very interesting reference to Gramsci also, by the way. Isn't what we're seeing, actually, the lack of public protest a part of the, the, the general movement of society from collectivism to individualism? If you look at the humanitarian side, it's on all levels. Fundraising, much easier when people can do their individual way of fundraising instead of participating together with others. It's easier to get funds to save a named child in Somalia than to um, try and address the famine situation. It is um, easier, you can, um, and, and Guadalupe, you mentioned how your son was engaged. It's easier to get this engagement. You can get 1,000 people on the street to stop uh, the return of an Afghan boy to Afghanistan, but you can't get the same amount of people to address these kind of injustices because it's on a collective basis. And isn't really the problem here, maybe, that the UN system is the epitome of collectivism. It's states. Um, and the state is being more and more um, unclear to a lot of people what the state is about. Is that, how can we address that? Hi, Caroline from Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, so we've talked about governments, UN, NGOs, and civil societies, and I w wonder where the private sector fits into this discussion, um, and how, if they should engage at all in humanitarian response. Um, private sector is often seen as being more effective um, in delivering services, um, however, their interests are very different to humanitarian actors. IHL and protection is definitely not on the top of their priorities. So how can we promote our added value as humanitarian actors when we can see private sector initiatives um, growing in the, in the sector? Thank you. Hello, um, I'm a Noah Stuin student. So um, I actually have a question for you, Mr. Donini. Um, so you spoke about the impact of the so-called new donors, I would say. So what do you think is our actual task for those? Like, how shall we connect with the new donors? What shall we do? Like, shall we share our own knowledge or shall we somehow work together? Thanks. Um, I think we have to speak to everybody, uh, including the, the new donors as they appear. Uh, of course, it's going to be a different world out there. Um, some of you may remember that four or five years ago, uh, Turkey all of a sudden made it to the top four or five um, donors in the International Humanitarian Action Hit Parade. Now they've dropped because they're using a lot of their money domestically. Uh, but um, working with the, the Turks was refreshing in some ways. I mean, they, the first country that ever sent a prime minister to Somalia uh, was Turkey when Erdogan was prime minister. He went and showed it's actually possible to work here. So um, I think uh, the, the new types of donors, uh, for better or worse, are challenging us out of our comfort zone, and I think that's good. Um, at the same time, I think that collectively, uh, we, we humanitarians, whatever that means, because there's Dunantis, there's faith-based, there's uh, um, new humanitarians who link humanitarian action and politics, uh, we need to also be clearer about what we want and how we operate. And, I'm not sure, having heard John Ging this morning, that I would go down the route of the SDGs. Uh, I think the SDGs are good for development, perhaps, but mixing development and principled humanitarian action is an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. Uh, and what is even more worrying, uh, I'm just rambling on here, what is even more worrying is, is how the UN is now couching the SDGs and what it does on peace and security as one construct in which humanitarian action should also be included. The focus on prevention is part of this. So uh, I think we have to be clear about who we are, 
do you want to stick to humanitarian principles, Dunantis principles, and maybe there's a role for a core of Dunantis agencies that will remain in the future, you know, around MSF, uh, the ICRC, and a few others, uh, NRC probably, um, and uh, maybe then there's a, a, a vast ecosystem of agencies that do different sorts of things, some very useful things, at the sort of linkage between humanitarian and development, or resilience, as people call it. Um, and maybe we need to formalize this uh, difference, in, dif distinction in roles. I'm not sure we're there yet. I know, allegedly, up my street. It's an interesting question, and I, I mean, I tend to, yeah, um, as you were talking, and as I was thinking about this, if I think about indigenous peoples, for example, in Latin America, I used to, you know, they brought, in the 90s, three Ecuadorian presidents were brought down just by the whole, you know, indigenous population walking down, sitting there for three days, and the helicopter had to go out, and the president had to flee the country, and they did it three times in the 90s. And maybe we don't see that that much now because even the indigenous population is, you know, working at a different level and more on an individ individual sort of type of thing. So you, yes, I, I find it difficult sometimes to sort of really assert that this is true without really looking at the real evidence. And maybe I'm just sort of thinking that you're right. Sure, maybe on the private sector question. Sure. <laughs> No, I, I, <laughs> just uh, before, on the UN system and um, the new donors, just an example why we should not cry because the system is collapsing. If you take uh, Yemen, for example, the first UN call was mainly fed by Saudi Arabia. There is a UN call in Yemen because there is a war in Yemen and the war in Yemen is led by Saudi Arabia. And this is Saudi Arabia that fin the, U the UN system. So the system is becoming a bit crazy on that. I mean, in question of impartiality, civil society looks like a big joke if you see this, this flood uh, of money. For private sectors, honestly, I don't know what to think about. I heard a lot about private, se private sector is the future of humanitarian. Uh, you know, there is lots of debates, lots of uh, book on that. Honestly, I don't see them on the main crisis at the field level. The only fact, I mean, and maybe Guadalupe, you can add about, about that, the, the main thing that I see with the private, private sector is more on a donor approach. Uh, for, there is more and more fund coming from the private sectors, from companies, but currently, uh, at least at the level of my own experience, I have not seen them so much, uh, private sector officine, as you say, but uh, Guadalupe, Guadalupe, I don't know. I want to uh, include the, the online audience, and Nora, you maybe have a couple on there, and then I know we have two others in, in, in real life here as well, but uh, welcome to our online people. Online humans, no bots, fake news and hate speech. Uh, Nora. Right, so we've got a question from Marc Dubois, um, who's asking, he wants to know something around media spreading false news um, and hate. And he's asking, blames this on others as if we are purveyors of truth. Self-critique on this. So maybe that's an interesting thing to think about. Thank you. Did, say that again. Purveyors of what? <laughs> yeah, and how do we know it's really him? It looks like it's really him. Well, he's asking, basically, is there any self-critique on us and the truth we are providing? This is how I would read the question. Sorry, Mark. Hi, I'm Raymond from the German Red Cross in Bangladesh. I was wondering how the changing nature of conflict affects the uh, humanitarian landscape in the sense that conflict seems to be more identity-based, maybe more religious or ethnic-based, um, and it does not fit into the standard border of a country. So you have conflict that goes that is cross-border, but also 
you have um, a government targeting its own population, for example. I think this is challenging for us to um, respond to, also because it fragments um, our partners. Um, it fragments the donors or the, the governments we normally approach. So I was wondering what your reflections are. Hi, I'm Tina. Um, when, when I'm looking at the title, Adapting to a Changing Political Landscape, then I find especially the term political is quite striking because this is obviously a word or term that, for example, MSF always tries to avoid. However, we do speak to politicians and parliamentarians, but then at the same time, if we, if we, look, at, if we look at the 0 0.7 uh, ODA commitment, then I'm wondering if all of the advocacy um, efforts are not completely failing because obviously not even the rich, the rich countries make an effort. So I'm wondering to what extent do you think we, we should be more political? Like, I mean, it's not a new question, but I think especially with this title, uh, we should talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to just uh, throw one in from me as well. When, can we, when we use the word we, can we be a little more specific? Because I'm really losing, I'm losing track of who, who we is. Um, maybe if I start with the, with the online question of you know, self-criticizing our own truth, and maybe just say, I'm not so sure whether amnesty or I talk the truth. I think I, wouldn't, I, I, I would be very wary of you, know, you regarding me as the truth of whatever. More, you know, I'm talking about a few facts, people, the suffering of people, people who have been arrested, you know, unjustifiably, people who have been tortured and people who have been, you know, ill-treated, disappeared and killed. I think that's what I suggest, you know, we talk about, I'm not so sure whether we should be talking the truth and I don't think we talk, we meaning amnesty, sorry, and the human rights or Guadalupe speaking the truth. So I wanted just to so that I'm sure this is going to be, I, I, I am not intellectually, very rigorously intellectually, so maybe some others here can sort of help me with the truth and facts. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a word if I, if I get well the question. Uh, on the 0 0.7, uh, should, we, should we be more political? I think we, so Médecins du Monde, <laughs> Uh, we are political. We are a political organization, but uh, we are actor of the political life. We used to say that we are impartial, but we are not neutral. Uh, we have point of view, we, we have values, we have mission. We, we are a political or organization. How could I say that in English? <laughs> I look for my colleagues. Uh, but our fight are based on our operation, but we are a political organization. We are pretentious, ambitious, we want to change the world, we, so uh, we are a political organization. The 0 0.7, uh, I think it's a good point on things that, everybody know 0 0.7? Uh, yes, because I will not be able to explain, so I will do it as if everybody knows. Uh, it's something we can do in, in uh, our own countries. I mean, we can mobilize, mobilize for that. I think in Europe, it's only uh, Great Britain that do the 0 0.7. It's part of the budget for the um, humanitarian action, long-term action, cooperation, etc. Uh, I'd like to comment on the question about the changing nature of conflict. Uh, one of the issues th that I think has happened much more clearly in the past few years is uh, how difficult it is for agencies who claim to be principal humanitarian actors to speak to both sides or to all sides. Um, you've probably seen in the media that uh, ICRC is greatly reducing its presence in Afghanistan. Afghanistan used to be their biggest operation for 20, 30 years. And uh, what has happened is that uh, uh, th there's an issue of perception of who, who is uh, 
who is who. And, and I think it's becoming more difficult to uh, clearly um, be seen as a neutral and independent player when you are, all your offices are in uh, cities controlled by the government, when it's becoming more and more difficult to engage in a dialogue or at least in a conversation with the various parts of the opposition. So by default, if you're not part of the government or if you're living in a village in rural Afghanistan and you see these people who drive by in big white vehicles, which are very similar to the big white vehicles that the military forces sometimes use, you know, you can, you can be, you know, it's understandable that you might be confused. So the, the, the issue of being perceived as who you are or as something else is becoming a much bigger issue. Which, and add to that how war has become much more um, you know, brutal in the sense that civilians are paying you know, the siege and starve uh, uh, tactics and uh, the delib deliberate bombing of civilian uh, targets it, it, it is something that has always been there in history, but I, maybe because of uh, everything is happening on our TV screens in real time, we are more aware of it. But the, 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 the opposite side of this is that uh, the, the work of trying to uh, negotiate access with people who basically don't trust you uh, is becoming much more difficult. Hello, Florian Westphal, uh, MSF Germany. Um, one aspect of the changing political landscape we've talked about a lot as MSF recently is the fact that uh, many states, including many very influential states in the West, seem to be involved in a process of totally undermining the system designed to protect refugees, uh, undermining it uh, in action primarily, but I think we will see that coming on in policy as the next step to and I'm just wondering whether what, what your take is on that, whether you think that's the inevitable sign of things to come, or whether there is indeed, as humanitarian and or political actors, something effective we can do to counter that trend. Or maybe whether you even agree with my very short one-sentence analysis. I'd like to address a, a question to Guadalupe. Uh, she, she, here, <laughs> as a South American, and as she mentioned a, lot, uh, a couple of times, South America, I'd like to, uh, to go to jump on the landscape in South America to be local. Uh, so uh, we know that in, in our region, uh, the political scene is degrading so fast in Brazil and um, Mexico and in, other, uh, in many other places. And as an effect of it, we see a lot of uh, uh, indigenous people, uh, human rights defenders uh, being a target for violence. I would like you to, so and South America is not on the news very often in the Western countries. I believe there are so many other um, crises in the world, but well, I'd like you to comment uh, on uh, the human rights challenges in South America right now. Um, I'm Cecilia, I'm, I work for MSF. Um, and I've been to many of the countries that were mentioned here in Syria, Iraq, Nigeria, etc. And I saw that there's a lot of people mentioning the civil society as an important role for fund, fundraising, as well as pushing governments against um, uh, crimes, uh, war crimes. And my question is, we know I've seen when I was in the field many issues about the speaking out, right? Because we cannot speak out in Iraq as much as we can. We cannot speak out in Nigeria as much as we would like to. So how do we touch the civil society? 
the civil society from South America that has a lot of local issues, from African countries, from other countries, how do we mobilize the civil society targeting fundraising and also pushing governments? My name is Daniel from Friedenthal University. Um, what, I mean, the lady said earlier on, we've been targeting donors and we've been blaming governments for producing more weapons than supplying food. We've been talking about the act, various actors. We know what the problems are. But the question, like she said, how do we mobilize? Because the theme we are saying is reshaping humanitarianism. So the point is, how do we get together? Because we are all here, gathered here. How do we get together to solve these problems? It's not just about saying the problems exist, there are the issues that have been raised, will continue to be raised, but then how do we come together to do this thing we are saying that exists? Great. Shall I start with the Latin America and, and, and the challenges there? I, Go back to the very beginning, you know, when I, when I gave my first intervention, you know, I do think the region is now in a much better shape than it was 30 years ago, number one, yes. Figures show that, for example, Brazil and Honduras and, um, well, then there's the Philippines, but in Latin America, you know, human rights defenders who defend the right to land, for example, as the highest number of human rights defenders killed, true, but we are challenging as you know as a region quite a lot of you know um those, those those in power we're challenging sexual and reproductive you know violations we're challenging you know those um uh, co corporations so i think we we are getting we are working together as a region to challenge those in power in a much more effective way i suggest belomonte had to be stopped okay or oh, well if it didn't have to be you know it, it's now a bit more difficult to sort of for, for the the government of brazil to just get on with sort of i think it is more difficult i know it's not perfect but i do think it's more difficult for governments to just do what they want nearly, nearly, I suggest, willy-nilly. So I, I, I think, yes, it's challenging, but I do think that there are things that have got, that have advanced. In sexual and reproductive rights, for example, there have been advances. If you had asked me 30 years ago that Mexico City was going to be the first city in Latin America to sort of have abortion on demand for the first 12 weeks on demand, which is... Uh, much if, um, more advanced than what we have in the UK when you need two doctors, actually, now they've just changed it. But So I do think there are advances, and um, it's not all very, it's not all that dark. Uh, well, let me uh, put a dampener on that. <laughs> uh, is there anybody from UNHCR in the room? Good, then I can say. <laughs> I, I want to go back to what you said about the refugee regime and how, um, particularly in Europe, uh, it's been undermined uh, by the donors and uh, to some extent also by UNHCR, although they're caught in a difficult position in between the pressure from the donors, uh, pressure from European countries who want to externalize these issues, uh, you know, building borders in Libya. Uh, the situation in Libya, by the way, I hope someone from Libya is here uh, in this conference to tell us about it because it's really very, very terrible. Uh, so what we are seeing really is that the, the uh, the, the Refugee Convention has been undermined by the very states who were at the development of this convention in the 1950s. Uh, we're seeing that um, the distinction between asylum seeker, refugee, migrant make no sense anymore. Uh, UNHCR, partly because it has to be mindful of what IOM does, uh, is sticking to a very, very classic definition of who an asylum seeker or refugee is. And if you're uh, leaving Niger, get stranded in the desert and die of thirst or are picked up by uh, smugglers and then end up in a detention center in Libya, are you an asylum seeker, a migrant, uh, 
or just a person of concern. And I think that the, the notion that uh, your identity changes during the voyage is something that the organizations haven't picked up upon. So, you know, the, some people say that we should not talk about uh, refugees and migrants, we should talk about survival migrants, uh, you know, people who find themselves in dire straits because they move regardless of the re reason why we move. But states are not prepared to open this um, Pandora's box, and I'm not very optimistic that the, uh, this new compact on refugees that's supposed to be negotiated next year, by next year at the General Assembly, is going to lead to anything very, very dramatic, apart from you know, lofty statements like we saw at the World Humanitarian Summit. Uh, civil society, <laughs> it's always for me. <coughs> um, yeah, Nigeria is complicated. You, could, you take the example of Nigeria, but if you, if you have been in Syria, you are full, it's full of local organization, it's full of Syrian initiatives. They are the real humanitarian actors today inside Syria. Nigeria is complicated, but um, I'm not sure I get your question well, but the civil society in Nigeria, they exist. They don't wait for us to exist. On most of the humanitarian crisis, the first actor is always the civil society, the local organization. Even if we go very fast, we arrive after the, the, the set of the, of the crisis. So they exist. For sure it's complicated, but uh, I don't know if some of you was in the World Humanitarian Summit last year in Istanbul. Uh, at least in Istanbul, if there were one decision, is also to share the part of the fund. Uh, right now, I think it's 4% of the global amount of the humanitarian aid that is going in the south. So it means 96% of the, of the money of the humanitarian business is for the northern organization. And one decision taken in Istanbul, we will see if it happened, but it's, it was in 2020, 20% 20 of, the, of, the, of the money, of the resources, should go through the, the South organization. Uh, there is big initiative uh, in Kenya with NIR and a big mobilization of transnational civil society in, in Africa, for example. I will do not pretend or explain you how to mobilize the civil society, but they exist. There is initiative. And maybe just for the colleague from uh, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, to be more effective, how we can be effective as organization, uh, as NGO, uh, with the migrant welcome crisis. I think we did, we did big things together, MSF and NMDM in the north of France, in Calais, uh, it, I mean, it's a legal issue, the uh, immigration crisis. So we have court case with the French government. We, so Germany is a bit apart, but I hope one day we will have court case with the British government. I mean, it's, it's a legal issue, and leg, to, to have court case, it's also humanitarian action. The, the, maybe you don't know, but in the north of France, there is a city called Calais, where, and this, this city becomes the UK border. So in France, in Calais, they, ma they manage the border for refugees, for migrants who want to, to go to uh, United Kingdom. It's seven, 8,000 people. It's nothing at all. For MSF of, or MDM to solve the situation, it will be three days. In three days, we can solve the health issues of, of this jingle. But it would change nothing. So organization as us, we want to change. I mean, we are dreamers. We want to change the law. We want to, to welcome the people, because these people have rights. Huh? And so we, we are acting on the, on the, on the, not on the health care on this, but on the legal issue. I, I was just saying we, we didn't get perhaps enough of what this panel 
beliefs should change. We're quite good at diagnosing, but we're not very good at curing. In that sense, the doctors failed and should be taken outside. Um, <laughs> and the log frame, the log frame will reflect. Um, so I don't see a lot of hands here, but so maybe we could say what, uh, oh, one there, uh, and then I, th I would invite the final, oh, up there. Okay, those two, and then I'd, I'd say perhaps talk about change. Well, <laughs> Okay. Um, my name is Simone Clavitta. I have been working for the last 10 years on behalf of UNICEF, not UNHCR, but UNICEF. Um, in, for instance, Pakistan taking up in 2011 the big mess of the 2010 flood. I would, um, so I spent two years in the Philippines after Hayyan response. I was in Afghanistan, uh, what else? Recently, Ethiopia, two weeks from now, it will be Bangladesh. What I would like to emphasize is that the UN system is certainly not perfectly working. And I'm the last person, and maybe UNICEF is anyway a little bit outside of the system, um, because it's a fund, not an organization itself. I would like us to be a little bit more humble about what a United Nations system can achieve and humble about what humans can achieve in humanitarian response. We have heard the figures in the morning from our colleague from Yun Ocha about the numbers of, um, you know, about the money going into arms and armed conflicts and how much funding we have or the Western countries are committing uh, and even actually paying into the humanitarian system. There are limitations in what we can achieve as humanitarians um, we can certainly, and we have to always improve and learn from failure, and I mean, that's what it is. It's a systemic loop. We learn, we fail, we learn, we fail, and um, as a human being, we are improving by failing. The um, easiest part is always to criticize how we are doing things and always question everything and look for something completely new. I'm rather, before we, have, we will really question the systems which we have in place, including the NGO approach, by the way, um, you know, when I hear that uh, the German Red or the Red Cross organizations are coming in, I always say, okay, it will take some time, and, but then they are coming in as a tanker, and I move out of their way with my teams, because they know they don't participate in the cluster system. So there are also things which we can improve on how the UN is uh, cooperating with the NGO system. But these are the nitty-gritty um, details. The main message which I would like to convey is, you know, we should always look into how to improve. We should understand our failures, um, but we also should be humble about what we can achieve in the global context of the power games we are looking at in a changing world of the conflicts moving into protracted crisis. And, um, you know, I like this comment on, you know, that many conflicts now are going into identity or are based on identities and religions. I mean, this is what we have to deal with. It's not, you know, the typhoon and Haya the Haiyan response was the easy part in my life. Yeah? The more difficult is Afghanistan, is Pakistan. We have so many religious identities um, where people don't have a very rational idea of acting anymore. Thanks. Uh, yes, my name is Chris. I'm working for a German NGO called Diakonie Katastrophenhilfe. I have a question regarding the changing political landscape and the um, impact of the current debate or negotiation that is happening in regards to the humanitarian system. I have a feeling that it's all about commitments, commitments, commitments. At the World Humanitarian Summit was about commitments. A few people then got together, a few states or NGOs got together these commitments. The CRF process now is running on commitments, commitments, commitments. Is this really something that is going to change anything? And is it really something that is able to address the real questions? Or are we just blindfolding ourselves to have the real discussions and to nail down the real discussions to, to really common solutions? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, actually, we wrote an 80-page report last year called Planning from the Future that has a detailed, um, recipe, uh, detailed recipes for change. But before you can change a, a system, you have to understand it. 
And uh, I, I worked for Ocha for 15 years, and I used to th always think in Ocha, you know, there's such good people here, but somehow it's not working. And uh, I think that's one of the tragedies of the UN system, uh, that uh, the, the intention is there, but uh, the professionalization, institutionalization, proceduralization of the humanitarian system, I think, has gone out of control. I think we've lost a lot of these kind of spontaneous um, bedside manner, ability to sit down and have tea with people that we used to have when I started in this business, of course, I was young then, and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, I think that if you were to sort of close your eyes and imagine what the ideal uh, humanitarian system should look like, would you come up with clusters? Would you come up with uh, a fractured, complicated system that uh, is controlled by a handful of, you know, of, uh, of strong players? So I, I think it, it's, you know, we're not here to, at least not, not my role here today to um, uh, reform the system. I think uh, my role here today is to provoke you into sort of getting a better or contradicting me in, with your views on how the system functions. But, uh, and also always think about how the system is perceived by the people who see the big white vehicles drive by and they're covered by the dust that the big white vehicles leave behind. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's not only, it's obviously not commit, not about only commitments. It starts there a bit, you know, because first you have to sort of show some, and then you have to put it into action. So we have to continue, you know, holding those people that have put those commitments to hold them accountable, okay, and make sure that they take the actions then afterwards, not straightforward, but I... That's where we all play a role as sort of a civil society in making sure that we uh, try and win more hearts and minds because I don't think we have won any hearts and minds for a few decades. I say 20 years, somebody said to me, no, whether it's more, it's 30 and maybe it is. We spoke, we've been speaking to ourselves, I think it's time that we really stand outside of the box and try and reach those others that we have sometimes even looked down on because we do have more in common than not. So I think that's the next stage, you know, find that commonality that we have with all those that all of us here together have looked down on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as Ben is asking us uh, to have a term of conclusion, let's say well, that is not just commitment and commitment, but at least uh, what we will change uh, concretely, well, I'm not sure concretely is English, but what we will change, at least for IDM, uh, uh, because I, I have absolutely not the pretension to change the system. Uh, so at least for at the level of our organization, we, are pre we, we will priori prioritize more and more the empowerment of our partners at the field level. The more and more the way we implement operation is with civil society, local initiatives, individuals, uh, with partners, let's say. The second thing is just uh, to conclude for me, uh, I think if the, if, I'm, I'm not sad at all about the death of the system. I will have a drink for the, for the death of the system. I think we, we need to change the system. Thank you very much, everybody, for the uh, interesting debate, and uh, we look forward to the rest of the day. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.